Hi, I'm Paul Marcel. In this episode of Angle Madness, we're going to do a number of odds and ends to these boxes here. And actually, we're not going to get all the way done with them all, and you'll find out about that near the end. So most of these odds and ends deal with little things on the inside that are going to be used for interconnecting parts and strengthening things and then just building up drawers. So let's get right into it. The next step of the build is to install the panels that we made seemingly ages ago, these four-way bookmatched burl panels, cut them to size to fit into the top of each of the three drawer tiers. Now in the case of the topmost drawer tier, this one here, I had to of course attach the part that creates this top bevel that kind of finishes the diamond look. Now normally this would have been a real nuisance to do because of the way that if I put a clamp on here, it just happens that where this top surface is located, it's a little bit off center of the board over here, the underlying board. So it tends to want to tip it in. But I recently took a seminar with Michael Fortune, and I'll be doing a review of that seminar actually on my blog a little later this week. So watch for that. There's some good ideas that came out of there. But one of the things that he did in the class, he talked about what uh, made jig making, what revolutionized jig making for him was this new glue called Nexabond 2500. It's called an instant wood adhesive. So basically this is a CA glue, but made specifically for wood. Now most CA glues rely on moisture, which is why though I've liked the idea of using them to quick clamp wood together, it doesn't work very well out here because it's so dry. This stuff here doesn't work only on moisture. Moisture acts as a catalyst, but there's the manufacturer claims something in the wood is the catalyst for it. Now in my mind, I'm thinking that's the tannins. Tannins tend to be pretty reactive components, so I'm sure that that's actually what triggers it. So one day I'll have to try that out on some different wood. But this worked very well for me in that, say for this facet here, what I did is I applied glue on the bottom and on the side here, and then I applied a drop of the wood adhesive up in this upper corner of the miter, and then in this bottom corner, so I was able to, you know, swish it side to side, press it and hold it in place, and then this gives you about a minute of time before it seizes up. So after that minute, you literally could lift the drawer up. So without the board being able to move, I could then apply a clamp just to make sure that on these longer pieces, the joint remained closed. So definitely something to add to your woodworking arsenal. This stuff was great. The top panels are going to be cut basically the same way as the bottom panels. What I'll do is I'll place the panel upside down onto the work surface, flip this upside down and press it down, and then I'll simply trace a line of where this rabbit appears on the back of that board. And then I'll cut it using just a track saw just like I did before so that I can do a nice fit. Before I get that far though, there are a couple things that I can do now to prepare for when we go to attach all this as a unit together using the pipes that we're going to be putting in between the layers. Now for that, what I'm going to do is I'll be putting a glue block in each one of these joint corners. Now the glue block acts as a great way to reinforce the joint, but also in the case of these pipes and rods, that's actually where the pipe and rod are going to be attached between the two tiers. Now with each one of these joints getting a glue block in them, I have to cut boards that have this exact angle of inclination on them so that they'll fit nicely. Uh, the idea will be to put these glue blocks into these corners. They'll be perfectly fitted to the corner and then flattened so that I can drop it down and it'll be glued to the surface of this for the lower block and then there'll be an upper block that'll be glued to the underside of the topmost panel. So what's nice is that each one of these corners like up here or down here all three pieces are going to be glued together, the two sides of the joint and then the panel that is attached to it. So that's going to greatly add some strength to the miter joint and it's going to act as our point for being able to connect these tiers together with the pipes. Now we're a couple episodes away from the pipes, I actually have some sample material being sent to me this week that's going to decide certain parts of the inlay that we're going to do on here. Uh, the inlay is going to be for a filete around the panels then I'll be able to order the pipes and then we can do that after we get the top panels and all these things sanded and pre-finished. So there's a little bit of time between now and then. So how am I going to decide what the angle is that I need for this glue block that's going to fit in there? Now, of course we're going to take a bevel gauge, but I can't put a bevel gauge just out here and expect to be able to read the correct angle because I wouldn't know if I need to hold the bevel gauge like this or like this or where in between. So how do I know where to put this gauge to get the correct angle so that when I put that glue block in, it's going to be flush against both of the surfaces? Now for that, we can go and look at another example. So if I take this speaker, which is of course what everybody uses as a square reference, and then I take a square. If I wanted to see if this is square, I'm going to put this square down here and I'm going to look at it and go, 
that's actually surprisingly square for a speaker. <laughs> but why did I decide to put it there? Why didn't I put the square like this and go, wow, there's a gap, it's terrible. Or why didn't I put it like this and say there's a gap, it's terrible. You know, we're trained to always put it here. But when you think about it, where is here? What it is, is this joint that we're trying to read, I'm putting this in a plane that's perpendicular to it, right? This is coming down perpendicular to this board that's down here. If I lay this down in that plane, and now I read it, that's reading whether or not this corner is square. So without nerding too much on math, what I need to do is I need to find out, well, here's an edge. Where's a plane that's perpendicular to it? So now I'm going to show you just using a simple die, we can figure out where that plane is located. If we look at a die, each one of these edges is perpendicular to the face that's flat on the bottom. So like this six side, if I put the six side down, this edge here is perpendicular to it. If I just place that in there, the bottom face, even though I'm rotating this around, it's rotating on that corner joint. That bottom plane is remaining perpendicular to that line. Doesn't matter where I put it. So all I would have to do is take my bevel gauge, you know, so however this is oriented, I just take my bevel gauge and I push it up onto that flat face and then I read the angle that's going to place this perpendicular to this edge. And it's really easy to do. I cut the corner glue block stock that we made earlier that fits into all these different joints into basically kind of one, in, one inch long blocks. The trick with doing these, of course, was partly we had to take this stock, we had to measure this included angle in the joints and then rip the stock to present that, but also I needed to make this bottom fit to the bottom of the box. So in each case on these blocks, you can see that there's a compound angle that's cut here on the bottom. Now this was also cut using the sled and the triangles and just measuring the bevel off of the side here in order to get this so that when I put it in, it's gonna go flush all the way down to the bottom. It's like this block number three that's back here that just sits perfectly. Get a number four back there had to number them to keep myself sane. So they all fit perfectly down in the bottom and present themselves about an inch up. Now if you look at the second camera where you're gonna be able to see the tops of these blocks, you can see that though I got the bottom to be flush to the bottom, the tops seem like they're kind of not. They're intentionally made to be perpendicular to the travel of the rod that's gonna be coming in here. If you were to set the rod down into that crack, the bottom of it is gonna sit flat on the top. Now I'll end up talking a lot more about that later when we get to the part where we do the interconnections of all that, but that's a key point. So I went ahead and I made six of each of the corners because I need three for this unit here and then three for the other unit I'll be making after I'm done with this production. So another thing I did is I marked and cut all the panels for the top. So this is looking kind of nice here. These aren't glued in yet. This is just pushed in a little bit. Now the top panel is a little bit more work because we have this four-way book match. So of course we want this thing centered. So I did mark some center lines on three, these three sides. Can't really mark it back here since that's where the column is, but it doesn't matter. We just need three and we're going to be able to place this. But the difficulty was how do I know where the lines are on this four-way book match in order to get those lined up? Now of course you could use a saddle square to sort of transfer that over to the side and flip it and then transfer it over to the, to the side where you're going to be able to see it and then do some lining up but it turned out that what I did was a little bit easier. I happened to notice that my drill was already chucked up with a 16th inch drill bit. So I just put this right on the line near the edge and drilled right through it. So made it a lot easier and it turned out that for all the panels, I could actually line them all up just using the hole. Now, one of the difficulties I had with the underside was scribing the rabbits. The, one of the things I had a problem with is occasionally I'd bump it so I'd have to erase all the lines and do it over again. So I didn't want to do that with this, so I put weights on it to keep it from moving. Second, the problem was that these edges here, they're not all dead smooth with each other, right? That's, we accounted for that. We accounted for making the rabbit a little bit deeper so that all these inequalities on the top, we're going to be flushing them to the panel anyway to make everything perfect at the end. The problem is, is that if this is a little bit higher than this side, well, there's going to be a gap underneath this wood when I'm drawing the rabbit. So if I take a pencil and I tuck it in and I think I'm up against the wood drawing, I'm actually kind of sneaking in underneath it and drawing the line a little bit further over. 
Now, granted, that's a good problem to have. It gives you more wood. But the problem I had when I had that on one of the panels, uh, when I was doing the underside, was you end up with, say, two edges that are further than they're supposed to be. So it becomes difficult to know which ones to cut and how to cut them because you can't fit it in anymore. So the way that we could eliminate that problem is to have basically a 90 degree pencil, a pencil that we could get all the way in up against a rabbit and drop it straight down onto the stock to draw the line. So I had to come up with a way to get a 90 degree pencil and I loved this. This worked so well, it solved a lot of problems. So what I used are these things called Accutrax pencil blades. What they are, and I just got these from Lee Valley, they recently started selling them, is it's a graphite pencil shaped just like a regular utility knife blade. So this is a regular utility knife blade. This is the pencil blade. So the idea would be that you could take your utility knife, pop out the blade, and put in an Accutrax, and now you could use this to draw lines where you want. Now I'm not going to use it that way here because this is awkward to get in there and I can't get it into the rabbit. However, this graphite, being shaped like this blade, is also thin. It's flat and it's also reinforced with some carbon fiber in it. So actually this stuff I noticed didn't want to really chip or break, not at all like you would on a sharpened pencil. So what I did is I took one of these and I just took a chisel to just push and break off a small section. That section, I took this CA glue and I put a drop of it on an eraser of a pencil and then I stuck that piece right on the tip. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push this into the rabbit go across. So that's the reason for the blue tape on this side is I really don't want to wear it on the back. I just want, uh, I only want it to draw on the bottom. Now this worked really well. So that was a great trick and I definitely plan on using that. So I'll probably keep this pencil for when I do my other unit. So then with that, use the track saw to cut, leaving the pencil line everywhere. So these are going to get glued in after I glue in the glue blocks that you just saw. And also once the glue blocks are in there, I'm going to take the chance to apply a finish on the inside. Each of the drawer tiers had a notch cut in the front of the panel that got glued into the bottom. So there's a little notch here and it recessed back. The reason for that was to be able to put a banding on here, so a piece of hardwood banding to the front so it hides the ply and it also adds strength to the side here. Now the other thing I want is I wanted this banding to be thick enough so that I could apply a profile to it with a router. Now the profile isn't on there yet and part of the reason for that is I want the profile to start just on the inside edge here of the opening and then end at this side here. So, you know, you could measure all that, do it on the router table, then cut it, then glue it. Then you have a profiled edge that you're trying to clamp. It's a nuisance. So it's easier to just do it here right on the project. Now this is proud of the surface down here, as you can kind of see from that angle there. Uh, this will be flushed, but one thing I want to do is I want to leave this proud for now while I route the profile because if there's going to be any splintering on the top edge, well, this part here is going to get cut off anyway. So we'll put the profile on there and then afterwards just do a little bit of sanding to soften up the edges and everything will be fine. So now the profile I want is basically just going to be a small curve, right? It's just going to curve back a little bit so that it gives a little bit more recess for your fingers to get into. There's already a recess on the drawer fronts but this will allow even a little bit more room while still allowing for a decent amount of hardwood on the front of the panel. So this is a three quarter inch core box bit. Now a core box bit isn't a bearing driven bit, so there isn't a bearing on the top that we can use to follow the stock in order to make this cut. So how are we gonna do this when it's already on the project? Now there are a couple different possibilities. I'm gonna use the OF1400 for doing this routing. So of course I could use a guide rail that I could just stick on, on the project at a certain distance and then use the stops. So that way I'll get a nice perfectly straight run on this board. But there are a couple things that that doesn't work for. For one, the problem with this is that because the router is attached to the guide rail and it's at a fixed distance, it's hard to start. The only way that you could start is you can plunge. Now that's fine for this profile, but if I had a profile like that had like a double curve or something like that, you wouldn't be able to do that. So some profiles can be plunged, some cannot. And also the bit you might be wanting to use, the portion of a bit that you might want to use, it may not even be a plungeable bit, depending on how you've got it set up onto the stock. So the guide rail doesn't always work for a solution for this. Now one of the things that we could do with this is that if we had a bearing instead of on the top, if we had a bearing 
on the shank, which is also called a rub collar. If we had a rub collar for this, then what we could do is we could set up a fence up here that the rub collar will run against, and then this, that'll guide it as it goes through the cut. The advantage there is that we can have this at the full depth for the cut, so it'll allow for a nice smooth cut that's straight, at the same time as allowing you to use a bit that may not be plungeable. So the way it's gonna work for me is I'm gonna take this 3 quarter inch MDF and we'll be placing it back here. Now I'm gonna take this bit by putting the rub collar on here. I'll be able to run it up against this MDF to make a straight line. But since I'll be placing the MDF back here actually up against this, when I go to do that cut, that's actually the correct depth that I want. The point is you're giving this a really good surface to guide it where there isn't a surface to guide. And this trick can actually also work with bits that have a bearing on the bottom. You could easily unscrew the bearing and just set it aside and put a rub collar on it if you don't actually have a place to run it. For example, this Roman OG bit does have a top bearing. Now, where I would want to place this, it might turn out that the bearing is very far near the bottom, so that the bearing is just barely touching this, or maybe it won't touch it at all. So if this can't register against the stock, then you can't really use the top bearing. It's kind of out of the picture. So in a case like that, this rub collar setting will work very well for you. So this is the way I'm going to work it. I'm just going to clamp this MDF here. I'm going to use the rub collar. I'll start routing around here, and I'll end routing around here. Just have a little bit of an edge here before it starts in with the recess. Then after that, I'll use the MFK 700 to just flush this to the top panel and also do a little bit of flushing that in, on the inside. There are a couple places here where I intentionally pushed it proud so that I could make a nice clean joint. So something I forgot to explain as I went and did this, these extra tidbits is that I flushed the bottom edge of the drawer. Now, if you recall, this drawer front was cut out of the entire piece of wood here. So when I built this, there's the rabbit. We eventually flushed the rabbit to the bottom panel. So that means the stock that we have here and here was shortened a little bit. And granted, this, depending on where I put the reveal of the drawer around it and trying to keep the grain to flow, you know, there's going to be stock that sticks down. So I needed to flush that. Now, the easiest way to flush that, especially since I didn't have the top on this yet, was to take this whole unit, flip it so that the crate was sitting in the drawer. So that's going to press the drawer down onto its runners. So then I just took the router and I used a flush trimming bit to flush it right up along here so that I was getting it flush to the bottom edge here. Simple thing to do, but glad I didn't forget. So I'm going to cut this episode at this point here. I had actually hoped to be a little bit further along to show you the box at the end with all the finish on the inside and the panel glued into place, all the glue blocks in place, of course, all ready to go for outside sanding because we're going to be doing some shaping there. I'm not going to do that as an episode. You've seen a sander in use. But I decided to hold back on gluing in this panel because if you remember back at the design episode, you know, this whole thing is to be an entertainment center. But I also want to make it so it looks nice when it gets recommissioned as a non-entertainment center. I'm not really sure if that exists. So what I discussed is it would be really nice if there was a little panel in the back that you could remove or, or move or do something with to be able to get all the wires from behind a component and kind of glom them all together and push them down into the column that's in the back. That would be fantastic. It would be a great way to hide the wires and not have them wrap around, and I really don't like seeing wires. But at the same time, I don't want a panel there that when it's recommissioned to something else, people go, hey, this is really nice, what's that? So I left it for later thinking, worst case, I would wrap the wires around the back and they'd sneak in through the back of the column. But I do have a couple ideas that I want to try out, which is why I got the scroll saw out and I have my panel that failed when we first did the vacuum bagging. If you remember one of them, I accidentally tucked some canvas on so this side here didn't get pressed properly. You can probably see a lot of ripples there. The other half is fine and the other side is actually fine. So I have plenty of material to work on to try seeing if I can cut a panel that's going to work well for us. So that, if that succeeds, that'll be in the next episode. If it doesn't, you won't hear about it again. So with the next episode, I'll have all the panels glued in, all the glue blocks in place. The inside will have been finished already because I do want this to be finished on the inside as well. And if this panel idea, a little port in the back has worked, and I'll record a little bit of that to show you how that worked. Uh, but basically, I should have the entire outside sanded. Okay, that's where it's going to go. Catch you soon. Thanks.